Hey everybody, welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel, Truth First Christianity in a Post-Christian Country, separating the objective and factual from the subjective and traditional for the benefit of our faith walks. Today I've got a discussion for you. I've been studying the Code of Hammurabi, which has a lot of the history of Babylon in it, and I decided to uh, review what the Church Fathers had to say about it, and I found some very mysterious gems in doing so both for the Tower of Babel and the idea of Babylon the Great written in the book of Revelation. Uh, first, let me briefly remind you what it says in the book of Revelation regarding this. Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That comes from Revelation chapter 17. Tertullian said this, So again, Babylon, in the writings of our own John, is a figure of the city of Rome, for she is equally great and proud of her sway. An interesting connection, but not one with proof. Next, Tertullian says, That powerful state that presides over the seven mountains and very many waters has merited from the Lord the designation of a prostitute. This is interesting. This is deep. This is mysterious. It's fascinating. Rome is considered the city on seven hills. So here is Babylon. This has to be factored in when we're looking at eschatology, end times prophecy, whether you're pre-A or post-trib, whether whatever type of millenarian you are, uh, whether or not you believe that all this dealt with things from the past, from Nero. This makes a clear connection between Babylon and Rome as the city on seven hills. Tertullian goes on to say that by a similar usage in the writings of our John, Babylon is the figure for the city of Rome. For Rome is like Babylon in being great and proud in royal power and in warring against the saints of God. We are called away from even dwelling in that Babylon of John's revelation. How much more so, it's pomp. Now, if you've watched the last few videos, you'd find it interesting that the Code of Hammurabi, we've made the connection that Hammurabi was the Babylonian king, number six, Amraphel, who served for 55 years. In that mythology in Hammurabi, we see references made to the Lord Bel, correct? We see an apocryphal, an apocryphal book called Bell and the Dragon uh, from the book of Daniel. So these things are interrelated in some way or another, and that can't be ignored. Now, let me tell you briefly uh, some more information in reference to this early Babylon with the Tower of Babel, and then we'll get out of here till next time. The confusion of the languages. First, let me remind you what it says in Genesis chapter 11. Therefore, its name is called Babel because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. That's precisely what God said he was going to do. If you look back a few chapters, we're in 11 with the Tower of Babel. Chapter 10 was the Table of Nations. In the chapters before that, God makes a covenant with Noah and he tells them to be fruitful, multiply, and cover the face of the earth. Replenish it. Replenir, right, um, is the Middle English and Old French word, replenir. Now listen to this. Not at the instigation of God, their plan was to build a city with a tower whose top might reach into heaven. They desired this so that they could make a glorious name to themselves. From that time he confused the languages, God, of men giving to each different dialect, and the Sibyl speaks similarly of this. When he says the Sibyl speaks similarly of this, he must be referring to an ancient writing we no longer have. That was Theophilus, written in about the year 180. 
And it goes on, at first there were only a few men situated in the land of Arabia and Chaldea. However, after their languages were divided, they gradually began to multiply and spread over all the earth. And some of them moved toward the east to dwell there, and others went to other parts of the great continent. Still others went northward so as to go as far as Britain, also by Theophilus. Now let's touch briefly on this idea of the angelic divisions of the nations. According to most English translations, God set the boundary of the nations according to the number of the children of Israel. That comes to us from Deuteronomy. The Septuagint, however, states that he set the boundaries according to the number of the angels of God. Based on that scripture together with passages from Ezekiel, one of God's prophets, located in the prophet section of the Old Testament, Daniel, and other scriptures, the early Christians believed that each nation is subject to the oversight of one of the angels. That was a universal belief at the time, and it ties in very well with the idea that there was a race of fallen angels uh, spoken of early in the book of Genesis and then referred to throughout the rest of the Bible, known by their remnant tribe titles such as Rephaim, Zumim, Zamzumim, Sons of Anak, etc. He set the boundaries of the nations according to the numbers of the children of Israel. Having said this, the 70 have translated it. He set the boundaries of the nations according to the numbers of the angels. We get that from Justin Martyr. Regiments of angels are distributed over the nations and cities. Clement of Alexandria. So you get the idea. These things are such wonderful, great mysteries and so interesting to study. Because at the core of the story, we get the gospel of Jesus Christ. From the beginning of the Bible to the end. In the New Testament, Jesus verifies that Moses wrote about him, that his story is contained, in fact, in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 3, the gauntlet is laid down, and we get the understanding that there's going to be a battle between lines of seed, that ultimately God will win through his perfect justice and afterward his mercy. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little snippet, and I look forward to talking to you on the next video. Please share, like, subscribe, keep the conversation going in the comments. Check us out over at BitChute, Twitter, and Facebook at Evangelist Nick G. If you want to support us financially, please go to Amazon.com slash author slash Nicholas Garrett and buy one of the many books I've written. Or you can visit our Teespring store. In the coming weeks, I'm going to be adding more material. For the time being, you can get a nice Truth vs. Christianity hoodie or a nice Christian t-shirt. Thank you so much.